All right, all right. What's up, y'all? Let's go. My name is Godfrey J. I got something to say for y'all right now. Hip Hop for Change, Executive Director. I want to talk a little bit about Black Arts and Resistance. All right, let's go. In this cold white world, our sons and daughters teach linguistics. Street griots speak free flows on rhythmic beats and dance out pain on streets just to manage with lost steps found in tuned in middle passages. Epigenetic apparatuses tend to gather us in patterns of resistance. Cultural capacitors that march into the distance through the vultures and the rats until y'all all learn the truth about the torture and the massacres. We only famous in corporations with access to the means of the production is getting a piece of the package now. So my resistance to conditions begins savages to Reach up and snatch it so my people bring it back around So besides writing these raps, I write checks I fundraise so my type of people might flex In a paid gig where you never have to code switch Organize so your people grow rich Yeah, when I say hip, I want y'all to say hop Say it, hip, hop, hip Ah. When I say hip, I want y'all to say hop Come on, hip, Ah. come on, hip, yeah Ah. I don't even know if most of the people on the thing said it, but you know, this is real hip hop. So I got to do that call and response. It's our culture. I'm going to keep it going. I got one more verse for y'all. Check it. Yo, when it's poverty and police predating where you live, it's more important than ever that we control the narrative and these kids' ears surviving the dull test ain't easy. But my people fix it while we all paint graffiti or we head spin and mentor the minds of kids. Oh, man. And mentor the minds of kids. So my resistance is to organize the biz and cut checks. It's fresh when these kids getting blessed with trauma-informed teachers trained and TB tested, fingerprinted and insured. And man, we get respected with 22,000 little brains get affected. Four million dollars in the game gets invested. The self-determination ain't a damn thing contested. 501c3 hip hop for change. Yo, y'all gonna see we gonna flip-flop the game. So you wanna join the fight for culture? Take your ass to hiphopforchange.org right when it's over. All right. So, how y'all doing? Thank you, Kafre. Welcome to the final event in our autumn series, Methods of Protest, Engaging Black Lives Matter Movements, brought to you by the Center for Global Ethnography. I'm Sharika Tiranagama. I'm one of the co-directors of the center, and I'm talking to you from the ancestral lands of the Ramai Tush people, now known as Mendo Park. This October, over the course of this series of live and pre-recorded conversations, we brought together scholars, activists, artists from Australia, Italy, and San Francisco Bay Area to focus on Black Lives Matter, both within and beyond the borders of the US. Our aim in this series has been to broaden our understanding of BLM movements in different parts of the world and to think collectively about how ethnographers can study BLM abroad and in the US by reflecting on the methods of protest and the methods employed to study them. So today's event, Arts and Resistance in Black San Francisco, is the last in our series. We'd like to start off by thanking African and African American Studies at the Department of History at Stanford for co-sponsoring this event, which focuses on how the performing arts such as hip hop and dance are crucial to black freedom struggles. I welcome you all this last week in October. We face a difficult week ahead and I want to send you all joy, fortitude and solidarity. I hope today's conversation can take us forward with strength and hope. And I am grateful that I can spend this hour and a half with such wonderful people and hopefully getting to know some of you in the Q&A session. So before we continue, let me just remind everyone that this event is being recorded and it will be available on our website. Go to iriss.stanford.edu forward slash ethnography and you'll find links to this video and other material that accompanies the session all under the programs tab. You'll also find another pre-recorded conversation with Aliyah Salahuddin Dunn, with Aliyah Dunn Salahuddin, Joanna Haygood and Colette Eloy Elwa on Dance Liberation Struggles in the Bay Area. You'll also find a recording of an interview conducted with Professor Marcia Langton on BLM in Australia and incarceration and custodial deaths for indigenous peoples there. At 1 p.m., we're going to begin the audience Q&A portion of the webinar. So we're going to have this wonderful conversation at one o'clock. We'll start with the Q&A, but please note that the Q&A is open now and it'll remain open throughout for you to write in your questions, which will then be answered at 1 p.m. You can find the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So our moderator for this event is Umnia Najer, a doctoral 
student in the program in modern thought and literature. So I'm going to now turn the conversation over to Umnia, who's going to moderate today's discussion. But thank you for being here. And, you know, I look forward to this, what's going to happen. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Aliyah and Kafri, for being here. You're both incredible people. And we are in for a great, fun conversation, I think. So Kafri J is from Hunters Point, San Francisco. He's the founder of Hip Hop for Change and the MC program, both of which use hip hop towards social justice and community building. He's also a performance artist who performed at the 2010 Democratic National Convention and has shared his stage with Rakhi, Method Man, Dead Press, Hieroglyphics, Talib Kweli, and many more. He also hosts a weekly Hip Hop for Change radio program on San Francisco's uh, KPOO 89.5 FM. And he's been awarded the 2020 William J. Zellerbach Award for Social Change and the Symphony's 22 Ellen Magnin Newman Award for Outstanding Arts Organization. Aliyah Dan Salahuddin is a graduate student at San Francisco's Sorry, she's a graduate of San Francisco State University where she earned both her BA and MA in American history with an emphasis in the African-American experience. She went on to become tenured faculty at City College of San Francisco where she taught both African-American and United States history and acted as the department chair of African-American studies. Her current research interests are focused on the Black freedom struggle and the civil rights movement in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's also a performing artist who's interested in utilizing public history and the performing arts to make local histories more accessible. Her most recent publication, and I really recommend that you read it, is A Forgotten Community, A Forgotten History, San Francisco's 1966 Uprising which is featured in the collection, The Strange Careers of the Jim Crow North. Kafri, Aliyah, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And we're gonna jump right in, so. Thank you. <laughs> the Bay Area has this amazing history of black resistance. And I'm wondering if you could both speak to your early exposure to art, resistance, black history, as youth living in the San Francisco area? And also how has the longer history of the city and your family's resistance within the city informed your identity, your worldviews and the development of your activism and artistic praxis? Um, sure, and I'm also currently a student at Stanford University in the history department, uh, which is, uh, so I'm thankful to be here to um, and to pursue this work and very thankful for the history department invested in this work. Um, so for me, my earliest memories um, and exposure to art, actually I, I did some reflection on this was in the mosque on uh, the Visadero Street singing, um, which I think really speaks to uh, the rich history uh, of the Black Muslims and the Black Muslim culture here. Another important piece I think that really informed my art and my practice is, is uh, the exposure. I have always been exposed to diverse sets of art and artists and culture. Um, there was, a, and that's a legacy of the civil rights movement and the black arts movement in the Bay Area. So we always had Capueta classes in elementary school for free. Um, I was exposed to Carnival, San Francisco. So uh, there were open mics and poetry, you know, reaching back to um, the beat poets and the spoken word poetry. And so um, the music culture, my mom grew up listening to watching Jimi Hendrix perform in the park, right? And so, so much of my experience coming up has been informed through art. I grew up going to Marcus Bookstores, one of the oldest black bookstores in San Francisco or in the nation actually, um, seeing books, seeing these artistic expressions of myself. And so art has always been a part of how I saw and understood who I was. I always saw positive representations of that from the pictures of my mom and my parents with Afros to the continued representations of that in the art that continues. So I, I think that for me, when I think about how art has informed my identity, 
I think art has always been a part of my identity and how I chose to express myself. I often say that San Francisco really is like an interconnected web of various natures um, where we may, we celebrate our individual um, identities. Like I identify as African-American, but there is a large, a very common and palpable San Francisco artistic culture that connects people across those cultural lines. And so, um, and, but there's room within that interconnectedness and that intercultural communication to expand and grow. So the Chicana and the Chicano art is informed by the black experience, the Asian um, and, and Pacific Islander art is informed and vice versa. So it's this constant sort of mixing and interacting that happens. And that's really reflective of how I grew up here. So art has always been a part of how I saw and understood myself as a dancer, as a poet, um, and as a scholar, because I, be, I believe scholarship and literature is an artistic form as well. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, that's, that's very similar. I mean, you know, we grew up right next to each other, Aaliyah. Um, so, you know, um, I, I, I came up much like you where art was, art was everything, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, didn't, I don't think I ever thought of art as being just a separate thing that people just went off and did at a certain time. It was just, it was ubiquitous, it was everywhere. Um, my father, he's the youngest of six black boys growing up in Hunter's Point. My mother's the middle child of seven. Um, and, you know, I, I'm fortunate that they worked their butts off to put me in a Montessori school when I was two years old till they couldn't afford it anymore, you know, in fifth grade. But uh, that got me a really, really rich start with art. Um, but I think my, my, richest, my richest source of inspiration around art was growing up in the Bayview Hunters Point Opera House, you know, with Carolyn Williams and the Young and Black Children's Youth Choir. So I'm singing about, you know, Black and beautiful. And at the same time, I'm going home and seeing my parents talking about the inequalities that are so stark in San Francisco, where I live in Hunters Point. But as soon as you go across San Bruno Street, it is a whole different ball game. And my father telling me about when he was a kid, you know, the fire department would beat up little black boys when they cross San Bruno Street, right? Um, and so, you know, hearing stories about my father growing up, he's an actor, uh, he's a singer, he's a playwright, and seeing his struggles trying to get black arts legitimized when across the city you have the opera house, right? And a lot of people don't know that, you know, in the 1906 earthquake, when that burnt down, people came and they did it in Hunter's Point, you know, during that time where they were being rebuilt. There's a rich history in the Bayview Hunter's Point Opera House, but that spot isn't even on the tourist map. You know what I'm saying? They say, don't go down there. So we've been struggling so long in Hunter's Point to even be seen. Right. You know, I see my dad working and working with Farad Dues, Danny Glover, people like that. And my dad's prolific uh, in his in his acting chops. And I even got a chance to go on the Chitlin circuit with him. But there's always been, you know, this this uneasiness that there's a, a roadblock that stops our art from getting out. Right. That crossover in this. And that's that's always been a, a theme. In, in my household, you know, and in a lot of the work that I do is just seeing the in, in, inequity, you know, the inequity of access, um, not even access to, to doing art, but the access that art to take you places, right? So that's informed a lot of what I, I've been going through, you know, trying to, trying to get rid of this like male toxicity that I was conditioned with and initially getting into hip hop, you know, talking bad about women and trying to find my power through materialism and whatnot. Once I really got off of that and started finding out who I really was, that that introspection led me to go back to my roots, you know, to, to, to go back to, to all these things that my father and my mother have been telling me while they played Sam Cooke in the background about the Black Panthers and about, you know, uh, all the all the fighting and, and, and that we've had to do as Black people. Like that, that was the theme of my my childhood is basically there's nothing promised to us. We have to snatch everything. We have to take it. We have to make it. We have to try to get our own people to see it because they're probably not going to see it. And it's self-determination. And I'm so fortunate that my parents, you know, instilled that 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 
I don't know that that focus on self determination from an early age, and that understanding that nothing is guaranteed to us, especially when it's us and it's representing us and it's from us and it's FUBU, you know, if, if it's us and it's blackness, you're going to have to jump higher over that hurdle right you're going to have to dig down deeper under that that wall. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, growing up in Hunter's Point, I think that was the most beautiful thing that I learned about art is you've got to hustle. And you've got to hustle to be heard, and it's beautiful once it is. So, thank you. So you know, much. I just wanted to say um, a couple, couple other things that coffee made me think of, just to draw some connections. You know, my mother was a, and still is a painter, um, and I th and her friends were artists. So I think even in this conversation, I'm realizing that our parents were like us, right, coming up, and yep. they were expressing themselves through the arts. So I think there's a, a generational passage of that artistic expression as expressed by Coffrey. And when we say self-determination in the Bay Area, I really want people to understand that our parents lived Black power. They created that movement here. That's how my mom and dad met in the Fillmore, which is now a music hall, but was previously a mosque. Um, so they met within this really rich culture where they were instilled, as Coffrey said, you have to sort of make it for yourself. I used to take the bus from Bayview Hunters Point to the mission um, to go to Edison Elementary, which is a really nice area. I mean, we're talking about multi-million dollar homes now. So that dichotomy, always being exposed to that dichotomy, seeing what was possible, going back home to where you were, yep. and then sort of you you respond to that. So so I feel like there's a very visceral effect of seeing that disparity and growing up in it. And we yeah. all were exposed to that. One corner, you can have a million dollar home and you flip a corner and it's a completely different neighborhood. And I think art was leveraged that inequality, as he said. So those are just uh, some important things I think um, should be mentioned. Thank you both so much for sharing about your upbringing and how you come to do the amazing work that you do. Um, Coffrey, I wanted to ask you if you can tell us a little bit more about Hip Hop for Change, how it came into being, and the organization's goals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you start becoming a positive rapper, your career is dead, right? Um, because the powers that be, three corporations own 90% of hip hop's platforms of perpetuation and the depiction of my culture, right? 90% of hip hop is owned by these three corporations and about 80% of the consumer base are suburban white uh, college age, you know, consumers that are buying a, a extra communal narrative and they don't really know all the cultural rules and values. So if you're rapping about police brutality, if you're rapping about uh, the Naval Hunters Point shipyard, these kids in Sausalito and Atherton don't really want to hear about that. So, um, you know, that frustration seeing the majority of hip hop culture being educators, activists in my community, they teach in literacy, they're teaching acting like this is the hip hop that I know. It's a, it's a circle. It's it's equidistant where everybody has equal access to the rocking. And it's not about smacking up women and, and objectifying them and basing your values off of how pathological you could be. Real hip hop in my community is wildly empowering. And, you know, there's this increased frustration in my life of not having efficacy, you know, to, to create some like financial, you know, some financial, you know, lucrative, you know, uh, businesses and, and structures and platforms for my homies who are struggling, struggling to be artists. And, and that's sad. So, I, you know, throughout my 20s, I was getting more and more frustrated. Fortunately, I got into activism. I became the first black director for Greenpeace San Francisco. Uh, those guys that flag you down on the street and then take all your money for polar bears. Um, and I ran that organization for about three and a half years, learned a really wild skill set. You know, it's not easy to take credit cards on the street when you look like this, but I got good at it. And I had this kind of aha moment one night when I had opened up for Rakim, but the one brown party company did not pay me a dollar. They said, we don't know you. We're not going to give you a paycheck. We just want to check you out first. And I was like, yo, you're not even going to pay my gas. Uh, and I realized at that moment that there's nobody out here that is down for the art. There's no one down here. That is, there's no one out there controlling any of the means of production that is down for the culture, down for the community members, down for the babies. They don't care about the impact. 
And we have this beautiful community that is wildly underfunded, you know? They don't have the money to advertise or promote. So it's the dopest hip hop show, but there's like 20 people in the audience and you're not getting a paycheck to rap. And your homie's gonna ask you to also spend five or six hours passing out flyers too, right? So I have this community that needs just a push, needs a financial base. And then I have this huge skill set on how to organize a half a million dollars a year and you know, employ 30 to 40 canvassers to have 40,000 conversations a year. So there was a little aha moment. And I went and I sit on Haight Street for a year, raised about 26 grand, incorporated, did the 501c3 paperwork. And now we have the dopest grassroots uh, activist-based organization ever. It provides us a base of self-determination. Uh, $800,000, for example, last year was our budget. We employed um, 131 community members from our community to stand out in the streets wearing this shirt, having conversations in affluent white spaces about the co-optation of hip hop and the criminalization of black and brown youths through that false depiction of who we are. Uh, and then we take that money from places like Lafayette and Piedmont and you know wherever, and we bring that back to the community. Uh, through that, we've taught 22,000 kids K through 12 by hiring a hip hop artist, uh, getting them fingerprinted, TV tested, trauma informed and getting them placed into schools to actually teach these kids the history of hip hop uh, so they can have positive, healthy sense of identity. And then we get them break dancing, rapping, doing graffiti. Uh, I don't know if y'all ever seen a room full of second graders trying to rap battle or break dance, but it's exactly what you think it is. Cool. Um, and so these kids are learning that their culture is beautiful and they're learning that their culture can take them anywhere to Carnegie Hall or starting their own business and if you're not hip-hop cultured which we also go into the suburbs and teach kids that aren't hip-hop hip-hop we teach them that they've been sold a bill of goods about who we are as people so we're creating that cross-cultural communication educating kids and then we take more money and we throw fat hip-hop events and shows and get local artists paid get them on the radio show and just Really, Hip Hop for Change is building a base of self-determination for hip hop culture and community to thrive. That's what we do. I think that's amazing. You are doing so many things. You're educating people. You're building community by having community events that are all age inclusive. You're just doing so many incredible things. Um, I yes. would really encourage everyone to go to www.hiphopforchange.org and check out the work that they're doing. It's an organization that just has a lot of different things that you're tackling. Um, just a very quick follow-up. Can you tell us about the next steps for Hip Hop for Change? What's in your future? Yeah, you know, uh, if COVID-19 didn't hit, we would be expanding to LA right now. Um, I, I'm very ambitious, you know, Greenpeace, they showed me 14 offices open nationwide, 500 people employed canvassing, pulling in $32 million a year. I think I can do that with Hip Hop for Change and take it further to have the educational component in every major black city in America. Uh, there's no reason we shouldn't have this education in LA. Portland, Seattle, and, and have a congruent uh, Rock the Bell style tour that's touring for our Women's Empowerment Show, or our Environmental Equity Summit. So my five-year goal is to have over 10 offices open nationwide, Atlanta, New York, Chicago, Baltimore, Miami, Dade, and we start building up this, this you know, this network of, of hip hop activism. You know, I think the, the, the biggest thing for, for me right now is, is getting prepared to expand but the thing I'm most excited right now is because of the bittersweet moment, because of George Floyd getting choked out and all this fervor, we actually got some, uh, we actually got a lot of donations. People, all of a sudden, it was trendy to support hip hop for change. I, I hate to say it like that, but uh, the trend of donating to us went away. It was a wave and that wave of supporting black movements to, to a lot of me, uh, to a lot of, you know, to us and a lot of the people in my community it seems to be over. Um, so we got enough money in that to build a studio that's going to be free in all ages for youth under 24 with no personal responsibility hurdles to jump over before they get to rap and get this stuff off their chest. So hopefully we'll be able to create re-entry programs, getting kids back from juvenile authorities, working with uh, foster youth and whatnot. Kids who have a lot of stuff off their chest and we can connect them to mentors that can teach them how to record, produce, uh, and then make their own art. I want to get this to a point where we are doing three 360 501c3 hip hop record deals for kids. What does that look like where you're not taking advantage of kids so we can be the ones making the culture bearers? If I can if I can fully fund 10 
Oakland or Bay Area hip hop voices that deserve the, the support where I can get them a full uh, LP produce and mix for them for free, a couple music videos for free, pay for their distribution and send them on tour around to preach. Like that's where I'm taking this, right? So that's that's what we're doing. We're gonna take this game back and we're gonna do something that corporations and for-profits can't do. Have a 20,000 person free all ages show teaching, you know, you know, connecting women to, to local women's orgs and women identified hip hop artists. They can't do that in capitalism. So I, I think that we can, Take the game back. And that's, you know, if you want to join the fight with me, holla at your boy, because we are going to take it over. Thank you so much. I really think your organization is amazing. Right on, right on. Um, the next question is for Aaliyah. Aaliyah, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a history of, uh, a scholar of Black California history? And if you could talk about why we need this type of scholarship that's specifically focused on the Black California experience. And then if you could also talk a little bit about why you've chosen higher education as a tool to empower people and specifically your work as director of African and African American studies and at San Francisco State. Um, yeah, at City College of San Francisco, I was director of department chair of African American studies. And um, yeah, so really, I'll start with a plug for the Black History of the West um, because that's the last question I sort of remembered and I may need you to remind me of some of the others. Um, but I'll start with my own journey, really. I, it is very miraculous that somebody from Baby Hunters Point who grew up on 100 West Point Road is now in a doctoral program at Stanford University. And it shouldn't be. But at a very young age, I remember my mother telling me that, you know, education was important. I don't remember a time where I didn't know how to read. Education was always instilled within us. And I feel like it came from the civil rights generation, the respectability politics, the representing yourself. And so I remember going back to that contrast, coming home and from school and saying to myself, I'm gonna get out of here. And if mom says I can go to college and live there, then that's what I'm gonna do. And uh, school was something that I always excelled at because we grew up in a learned place. I think it's important to remind people that some of the oldest universities in the world are in the continent of Africa. So we're a learned, knowledgeable, scholarly people. And the idea that we are not scholars is very poisonous and, it is, and is insidious. So my last name, Salahuddin, is really about reminding me of my greatness, of my strength. And so my experience is not uncommon. There were many homes like mine who grew up watching sci-fi. There were plenty of books. We went to Marcus Bookstore. We always went to the library. We always went to the museum. We went to the symphony. So the small the really tight geography of San Francisco did, didn't separate us. We might've been separated by class in some ways, but culturally we weren't. So I got to experience all these things. Um, and that's what eventually got me through high school, you know? And um, there was a moment in high school where I couldn't afford to take the SAT prep class. Um, and at that point, I don't know if, at that point, I just walked up to City College of San Francisco, basically, and signed myself up for courses there. Um, and that's where I really began to professionalize myself as a scholar was through the community college system. And uh, that's a, a long story, but eventually uh, from 2001, when I started as a young, um, barely graduating high school, you know, high schooler, um, I went from student to student worker, to staff, to um, intern, eventually transferred to San Francisco State and came back to City College and tutored English in the African-American scholastic programs, working with students who were just like me in the same program, um, big up to the Umoja program at City College of San Francisco um, and the African-American scholastic program started by Dr. Henry Augustine. Um, but 
uh, it was really there that I started teaching. Um, and from there, I got an internship program um, called the Grow Your Own program. It was a fellowship program, which was meant to diversify the faculty and staff. Um, and originally, I think if there are young people listening, my goal was not to be, Aliyah is going to be a history professor. My goal was to get an apartment so I can afford to buy food to eat, so I can have the clothes I wanted, so I can have provide for my mom. And I just went along on the journey. So through the arts and through mentorship and support, I was eventually able to graduate from San Francisco State University. And um, the original department chair of African-American studies, Glenn Nance, retired, was retiring and he'd been there a long career, over 40 years. He started the African-American studies department in 1970 on the coattails of, of San Francisco State, which was the first and only school of ethnic studies in, in the nation. And so um, I taught and I mentored and I fed students and I organized events and I advised them and I taught more and I taught more, but there was a big part of me, Professor Don Mabalin um, and Professor Paul Longmore always pushed me to pursue my research pursuits, one of which was Basie Hunter's Point. And through all those years from 2012 to maybe 2015, I continued to research and write on my own um, because essentially at San Francisco State, I had learned the research skills, basic research skills and, and, and sort of in-depth research skills I needed to know to do the work on my own. And um, I went on an NEH through the National Endowment for Humanities. Eventually I was able to get a publication, which Umnia mentioned earlier, and uh, Jean Theo Harris and Dr. Kamosi Woodard, two very um, prominent scholars who I admire so much and who I'm so thankful for, you know, helped me to see and believe in my own tent to show me that these stories and these histories are important and that as much as important as it is for you to help the, the students in your community, the African-American people in your community, think about yourself nationally, think about Bayview nationally, think about black students everywhere, think about high achieving black students at the university. Um, and I, so I took a chance right before COVID. And I do wanna mention, you know, part of two things, and I will be succinct, Umnia, I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up, two things. One, I wouldn't be here without dedicated K through 12 and early education teachers. I mean, who are working in the trenches right now, online, 24 seven, you know, and so that that's a big part of it too. It wasn't just the professors, it was my K through 12 teachers who saw something in me and gave me that extra book to read, to take home. But I also think the other thing I wanna mention that's important is that as a black faculty member at a community college, one of the few, there was so much invisible and unpaid work that I was tasked to do in the wake of this movement for Black Lives emerging. And that's also what pushed me to um, want more from myself, to invest in myself. We know Black women um, bear the brunt of a lot of the work and we're doing the work and we're dying literally as a result of that work. And for myself, and I'm used to suffering. And so coming to Stanford University was about I can still do this work and I don't have to suffer. I don't have to be selfless. And I think one of the most important lessons that I could teach my students was to pursue my dreams in the same way I challenged them to do that. And that's how I got here at Stanford University. And I'm still trying to figure it out, but I'm, I'm thankful to be here. And seeing your career, I, I want to let everybody know that I was at City College in 2001 with Aaliyah. <laughs> and I remember talking about uh, Mr. Whitehead, uh, who was teaching African-American uh, history. And we were complaining. We were complaining. I, I think I remember saying that you should teach the class, Aaliyah, back then. But it has been such an inspiration to see your career, you know what I'm saying? It's been such an inspiration to see you walking around Thank City you. College in bright yellow Kente cloth suits as an educator. And I'm like, yes, yes. And, and you know, I think the, the biggest thing that 
that you mentioned is like those representations that we've had of black excellence that were so necessary in forming our understanding of our own efficacy, right? You can't, you can't, you can't have these ideas of where we can be if those places seem closed off to us and, and to have those teachers and those educators like, no, no, your career is bigger than you think it is. It's, it's so important. So I appreciate you being that mentor for other folks too. Thank, Thank you, Kofi. Thank you. Um, the next question is for both of you. What are the biggest issues facing San Francisco and the Bay Area right now? Um, what does change look like in your mind? Are there organizations that are doing indispensable work? And also, if you can talk about some of the barriers that local activists, artists, and educators face in the work. And just generally, if you can tell us what the biggest problems are facing the Bay Area, especially things that might not be on people's radar. May I? <laughs> Please do, and then I'll hop on, because I was like, <laughs> So everything I think can be boiled down to two words. Uh, they're on my shirt, right? Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we face in San Francisco is white supremacy, is the classism that we face is so stark. Um, I think one of the hardest things that I deal with in my job, especially fundraising, is dealing with liberal racism, you know, that 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 white moderate racism that, you know, is in control of a lot of the financial efficacy and resources and whatnot, you know. I think that's one thing that I've been so happy about Hip Hop for Change, being able to start from a grassroots base where we're actually having one-on-one -on -one conversations with regular people instead of having to start by writing grants from foundations who, you know, we have to reaffirm our value as people before we even tell them what program we're doing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I, I really think that the biggest problem that we face in San Francisco is this, this sense of entitlement and the sense of liberalism and progressiveness that people think is exclusive from races, like, like just, you know, people are just like, oh man, I have a black, a black, you know, grandson. <laughs> like this, that's what San Francisco feels like to me. It's like, oh, my best friend's black, right? And, you know, it, it, it was a long time since there were liberal Berkeley white folks punching Nazis, right? They are, are really organizing hard. There was this really big hiatus of liberal, progressives in the Bay Area forgetting that you actually have to march. You know what I'm saying? But they held on to this like, oh, we're good. We're high. And then while while we're, we're, we're acting like we're progressive, you know what I'm saying? We're seeing people dying in Hunters Point from cancer, from the Naval Hunters Point toxic shipyard, and then having fake people come and fake clean it up and leave the radiation there. And right, like this is how we're treated. People make money off of our suffering. They make money off telling our stories, right? And then they bounce after the story's been told because that's cool. And it, you know, it kind of feels, it feels like that in so many different ways. I don't think people understand how hard it is to even be a rap artist. For example, I was working with an organization. Um, we wanted to throw a, a gospel hip hop rap contest at Martin Luther King Park. Sounds great, doesn't it, right? You know, kids rapping about Jesus and then they, there's going to be no losers. So everybody was going to get a prize. And in order to throw these events, you have to get special event insurance, right? So I called them. I said, hey, how much for the special event insurance? Mind you, the budget for the show was $1,000. Uh, they said the quote for the day's insurance was $2,000 because we're hip hop. I asked them, what if it's gospel? And they said, oh, it's just $200 then. So we're legally able to be discriminated against because we're not protected as a cultural class. It's we're hip hop. So uh, that doesn't stop hip hop from happening. That stops cultural communal hip hop from happening. That doesn't stop another planet entertainment, right? That doesn't stop Uncle marketing from doing hip hop and bringing out Lil Wayne and Lil Yachty and all these people talking about whatever, but that does stop the people that I rock with. So those, these are some of the barriers, extra insurance rates because people attribute pathology to our cultural narratives, right? What else do we have to face? You know, when I walk down the street, people grab their babies more than half the time, they just grab their babies. And, you know, I've learned to, to joke and tell people that I'm full. I, I, I'm full. I'm eating breakfast. Your baby's safe, right? <laughs> I don't eat babies. But but I think these same people that I talk to doing these grassroots jobs, you know, flagging people down, hey, come talk to me about racism. And they go, oh, my God. And they grab their baby close. And I say, I don't eat babies. And they go, oh, no, wait, wait. No, that's not what I meant. And then they start arguing with me about how they weren't being racist. 
This is the biggest problems that I think I face as an activist and as an artist in San Francisco. People thinking they're so on point, they don't question their biases. It kind of feels like when I was first learning about patriarchy and I was like, no, I don't disrespect women. No, you know what I'm saying? Right? That's that's what I hear from a lot of of white San Francisco to be straight up and put it bluntly. So a lot of my, a lot of my practice is making sure that a lot of, you know, it's just making sure that we are working for us first and then also leaving the door open for other folks from other communities to come in and say, Hey, y'all come on in. Y'all are invited. We have cake, you know what I'm saying? But making sure that the platforms that we're building are designed for hip hop cultured people to be lifted up. Yeah. Um, you know, I see the problems definitely economic, but I think the problems go all the way back to when African Americans really first started to come to the Bay Area in large numbers. And we can go back even to the 19th century when African Americans of means were able to come west. They were not able to get loans at Wells Fargo Bank. They were not able to own homes. They were not able to start businesses, no matter, it didn't matter whether they had the means or not. And I think many of those same attitudes that helped to shape city space, that allotted resource are still prevalent. So I would agree with Coffrey that, you know, there's a liberalism in the city um, that allows for a veneer of inclusion, but underneath the system has always been the same. So the issues are the same, police brutality, a lack of economic opportunity, the erasure, right, caused by that lack of economic mobility. If you, if the rent all of a sudden goes from $700 to $2,200, and the average black family in San Francisco's income as of, you know, let's just go 2010 was $29,000 a year, but the income you need to live in the city is over $100,000. If you look at the poverty line in the city, is $90,000, that is the poverty line. And so we have made all these amazing strides really from the mid 20th century. What, if you look at what black people did in the Bay Area, it was incredible. And, and, but how do you fight such a formidable force economically when you can perform and you can do well, you can go to school, you can even get a doctorate and still be living in your car? in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you couple that with race, and you couple that with gender, and you couple that with sexuality, you know? And so I, I think police brutality um, is also another major factor as well. As we have all these new people coming into the Bay Area who do not have a sensitivity um, to the various communities that are here, there's that entitlement that Coffrey spoke to, but then somebody like Alex Nieto, San Francisco local, born and raised here, former City College of San Francisco student is on his break. He's wearing 49ers gear because he's from San Francisco and is representing his city. Somebody who's not from the area calls the police and he shot 48 times. So I think that these ideas about who we are are really insidious, despite the fact that we've been here. And I think a lack of economic opportunity is key, right? Which is why organizations like Hip Hop for Change are important and accessibility. I was able to come up through the community college system and the public school system in California to get where I am. And so it's just a matter of building the bridges to the resources that are here. And so our students, our babies, our young people do not have those opportunities. If they have to take a bus two hours to get to that dance class, they're not gonna go. If they have, if their parents don't have the time to go to the store to get the food, they're not gonna go. And so we've actually regressed back from the 1970s to a place where African-Americans and others, because this is a multi-ethnic city, right? But to speaking about the African-American experience are wet, wet, miles and miles, and we can't even call it a poverty line. They're, they can't even see the poverty line. They are struggling to get by and their situation is only exacerbated by COVID-19. I, I would just like to add, cause you, I mean, you, you always get me thinking when you speak of Leah, but you know, this reminded me of a situation where, you know, Hunter's Point 
Kaloo Street, where my family lived, where I grew up, they're wide sidewalks, right? And there, there was a lawyer who moved in, new to the neighborhood, right, because of gentrification. And she didn't like that people were parking on the sidewalks uh, and making it so she couldn't walk directly straight up from Third Street. So she starts complaining. All of a sudden, all the families on Kaloo Street start getting $110 tickets weekly, weekly, weekly. And this one person who came in, you know, white lady comes in to a black neighborhood, but she don't like the way people parking. So now hundreds, like hundreds of thousands of dollars are being pulled in. Like this is furthering Hunter's Point into an even bigger debtor's prison. You know what I'm saying? Where even when we get pulled over for a traffic violation, we have four or five cop cars, you know, behind us, uh, you know, and then we get a ticket and stuff like that. It, it's just the nicks and cuts and scratches let alone trying to get to that dance class, you know what I'm saying? That's out in wherever, you know, the 54, the 15, the 24, the 44, right? And all these buses that take us away to go get resources. Because again, we, me and Aaliyah, you know, people, black people in Hunters Point, we know white folks in the city. We know everybody. We know the Asian folks. Like we have to go everywhere to get education, healthcare. Like we have to leave Hunters Point for everything. So we know who y'all are. But no one really knows who we are other than these stories that are being told about us. Every white person in like in San Francisco has that Hunter's Point story. That one time they had to drive through there and it was like, ooh, when they tell it, they get kind of excited because, you know, it's the one time they went to the hood, you know, and, and I hear that. So how can we live together and work towards the same means if one group of people is wildly ignorant about who we are as people at the same time, they're being conditioned by corporate media where black people are 3% of advertisements and it's just over-sexualized black women, you know, athletes and fake gangster rappers, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, again, right. the, the biggest problems that we face, again, is this super segregation cross class where black people are just over here. You know what I'm saying? We're literally just over here. Go ahead, Leah. I'd be a miss. If I also didn't add on to that too, Baby Hunters Point has one of the largest Superfund sites in the country. Radi radiation left over from the Nuclear Radiological Defense Laboratory from World War II. Um, and so what's interesting to me is that one of the biggest problems that the city, not just Black San Franciscans faces, is our toxic past and our toxic legacy. Um, the city has gone ahead and built multi-million, you know, these half a million dollar condos on this land that was relegated to African-Americans before to segregate them away from the city. Now they're trying to move in people with means and make sort of a mixed economic community of people, but that toxicity is still there. So in Bayview Hunters Point has some of the highest asthma rates, some of the highest uh, breast cancer rates. Um, there were people who worked on those shipyards, like asbestos dripping all over them. And there was a toxic fire in 2000 that smoldered from under the ground, radiating, emanating toxicity. So, you know, these issues are pervasive and I think they impact more than just black San Franciscans that by investing in Bayview, and, and Fillmore and Lake Sh like all the black communities, because it's not just two, they're, they're mm -hmm. multiple, right? By listening and investing and learning and connecting with the black communities in San Francisco, we actually gain keys and strategies mm -hmm. of how to help this city as a whole become better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, that's the problem is the, the, these, these barriers that keep us from hearing our stories. Yeah. So this event today is about storytelling. And at Stanford, we're very used to academic events where we use a lot of jargon and we use a lot of terminology and we love to do this. But for me, it was really important to bring in community voices, people from the area, you know, uh, within miles from Stanford so that we can see as students and as academics here, the importance of including community voice and going to these places and not just being in the Stanford bubble because our scholarship and our livelihoods will be enriched if we listen to the land, if we listen to the people, mm. and if we listen to those that have been here for centuries, right? Yeah. And since time immemorial. And, and just to add to that, like when I worked for Greenpeace, Greenpeace, their office is in Petrero, right? <laughs> and I spent two years being like, hey, Hunters Point Naval Shipyard, please help. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I wrote songs about it. I talked to the, you know, all the people dealing with toxics on their campaigns. 
but they said that's not really what we do. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't know how to be heard with big organizations like Greenpeace. And I'm not knocking them. Maybe they, you know, they're in their own lane. You know what I'm saying? But if you're sitting on stolen land right next to Black people being poisoned and you're the largest environmental organization in the world, I don't get it. Why you can't even be like, hey, that's messed up. Until we start centering the struggles of brown and black people in the environmental conversation, we're not going to win. You know what I'm saying? Like at all. You don't talk about saving puppies without putting little puppies on your arms of the angel commercial, right? You know what I'm saying? You don't talk about issues without, you know, putting the people who are bearing the brunt of that cost up front so they can speak truth to power. And that's what we need to do. So that's a lot of the issues we're facing. There's a lot of people, you know, the African-American arts and cultural complex right now, really working really hard. Baby Opera House working really hard. There's so many different movements that people can get plugged in if they want to elevate voices of black and brown people. Um, it, it, you know, it's almost willful ignorance not to get involved at this point. You know what I'm saying? Um, for me, if I see a, a woman getting yelled at across the street, it's up to me as a man to step in and be like, yo, hey, hey, that's not, no, stop it. You know, we have to protect people. Um, and, and that's being an ally. So my, 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 my request to Stanford is to not be Greenpeace sitting right next to a super toxic, super fun site and, you know, and, you know, uh, black people being poisoned. But Stanford, you, you got such just a prestige like when Stanford speaks people move uh and you know right next to East Palo Alto you know right next to all you know San Mateo and all these populations where arguably there's people who have been working and studying how to make something out of nothing forever right you want to talk about people who have acumen to hustle work hard dedicate themselves let's give people a chance and I, I think it really comes down to number one who controls the narratives of who black people are we need to control it. Number two, who is making sure that we're prioritizing putting Black voices into these spaces where they have not historically been given a chance? So that, that's the biggest problem. So us having self-determination over the narrative and people being real allies. Thank you. Um, I want to, we just have a few minutes left. I want to ask you both about your artistic practice and about dance. Both of you mentioned dance. Um, and Aliyah, I watched the recent talk that you gave with Colette Eloy and Joanna Highgood. And in that you say that dance has always been a part of the black liberation struggle in the Bay Area. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. And Coffrey from you, I would also love to hear about kind of, it sounds like you're doing a lot of embodied kinesthetic kind of movement with youth. Um, and if you can talk about the philosophy behind that. Yeah, um, and I'll keep it brief because I know we want to um, have time for people's questions. So let's keep our answers succinct so we can like make this a part of a larger conversation. Um, for me, dance, I say dance has always been a part of the Black liberation movement here because I'll just speak from myself, from my body. My body is telling me to get out of my head right now. When I first stepped into a dance studio, I felt my showed I, it's the first time that I stood up. It's the first time that I held my head high. It's the first time that I learned to walk. And so I think such an integral part of the black power movement in the Bay area was building people up, pe building people self-confidence through culture building. And when you can, you can physically move your body through space whether that be walking down the street, how you walk. So if you think about the Black Panthers, what were they doing? They were performing how we wanted to be. They walked high. What were the, the Black Muslims doing? So it was about, to me, it, 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 it's not necessarily a dance in that sense, but it was about take, if you can take control over your body and the way it, which in, it moves in the world, then that gives you the power to will change within it. So by carving out these, this space, you know, with my body, by tapping into rhythms that are naturally innate me within me, I was able to learn history and build confidence and gain knowledge of self, which was a form of power for me. And I'll keep it succinct too, but you know, hip hop, there's a reason why it started with the DJ. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It makes sense. James Brown said, as long as you remember to come back to the one, you know what I'm saying? Like beat, 
and rhythm, when you hear that beat bumping, you just, whether you got rhythm or not, you just get into it. It's natural, you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure if this is encoded in our epigenetics or what, you know what I'm saying? Or if it's just a cultural thing, if it's just uh, nurture, but I think I think rhythm and, and movement it's something that I grew up, it was just a part of everything, right? There's just always the soundtrack bumping in the background, people dancing while they're cooking and, and whatnot. Um, when you look at break dances, for example, right? If, if you look at people who've been so stressed out, got so much, to, you know, they're carrying on their shoulders, it, it makes sense why they call them break boys and break girls. Like they get out on that stage and they let it all out. You know what I'm saying? They, they break, they can go into it. And, and really that space is a space that is authentic and it's a space that we own. There's not too many spaces like that, you know, where we just own our bodies, we own our space, we own the right to move, you know what I'm saying? And it makes a lot of sense. And so dancing is- right it's just freeing. It's really freeing. You know, it's freeing. And, and you can even go further and start talking about, you know, uh, like kinesthetic knowledge, you know, proprioception, vestibular sense, neuromuscular junctions, you know, kids start b-boy and breaking and whatnot. Then they start talking to mentors about veganism and health and wellness and stuff like that. But, but yeah, da dance, it's just in our blood. And Aaliyah, could it's you transcend about some of the, you've done such amazing dance work and work that's interdisciplinary with history, with um, Bayview Hunters Point. Can you talk a little bit about those two? Yeah, um, well, you know, my earliest dance classes were in Bayview at Aunt B Park, um, uh, which is, oh, Aunt B, rest in peace. But really through um, engaging with scholarship, I ended up doing dramaturgy for Joanna Highgood uh, the dance company, Zockel Dance Theater, based out of Bayview Hunters Point. Um, and her work is very interdisciplinary. Um, and so from based on sort of, I ended up gathering and informed by oral histories. So I was gathering oral histories. I was telling her what kind of trees were in the, these are, this was the landscape would look like, and that would inform her work. So it was really started there. Um, but I started dancing at San Francisco State and at City College of San Francisco with incredible, amazing dance teachers, Dr. Rose, Alicia Ray Pierce, and I started studying Catherine Dunham technique. Um, and so dance was about not just transcendence, but it was also a place where I can, it was a laboratory of learning for me. And so, um, and it connected me with all these other people who were, who, whose knowledge was embodied and I feel like history allowed me a bridge into the theater and performing arts. So I, I often say that um, I dance brought me to history and then history brought me back to dance mm -hmm. because now I'm working with people trying to help them gauge the history and learn more about the experience to inform their dances. And, and so I hope to do more of that work. Um, and I think it's so powerful for young people to get out of their minds and to feel themselves, right? And so that, that's one of my goals is to be teaching more young people dance in the future. That's amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, it is time for the Q&A and I'm just going to read out some of the questions that we have. Um, the first question is how has COVID-19 affected your work both positively and negatively. And it says, shameless plug, do you know about my company, Hip Learning? Hip Learning, oh, sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, when you're built off a grassroots fundraising model where we have a thousand conversations in affluent white communities every uh, week uh, with 34 people on staff at any given time making a living wage and having access to health care, that all stops. So in March, that stopped. And that's like 80% of hip hop for changes funding, um, especially where we get our monthly donors that really allow us the breathing room to be stable as an organization. So in March, that stopped. We also lost every school contract we had. So we had a goal of teaching 15,000 kids this year um, and all those contracts got canceled instantly. Uh, we also had about $25,000 worth of um, event budget 
uh, canceled through the De Young Museum and the Asian Art Museum. We were about to do two events with them. So everything stopped and we had to hit the drawing board. Um, so number one, um, our grassroots officers were eligible for unemployment. Um, so that was great. It was, it was uh, emotional, it was tears, but we got them taken care of. The problem is that our artist educators that are on contract with us, most of them were not eligible for unemployment, uh, given that they're usually working under the table sometimes because hip hop artists don't really have a lot of real, you know, uh, professional, like, you know, platforms where in which they get paid. So a lot of those artists were just pretty screwed. I mean, if you're a DJ and you've been working under the table and you don't know when your next gig is for the next two years, like, what are you gonna do? So we've been pivoting, fundraising our butts off to produce online content that would, you know, give these people work, distance filming. Uh, so they can film online tutorials so we can continue our education. So this year we've taught about a th over a thousand students. So we think that's still good. We got an online uh, platform as well. Uh, and we have been pivoting to not throwing events, but to helping out other organizations with their events on Zoom. So adding hip hop components to it as well. Uh, we just did our first in-person education with Larkin Street Youth Services yes, uh, day before yesterday. So that was, we're, we're kind of back and we're starting our grassroots back kind of a little bit. So we're still trying to figure it out. What's really hard for us is that our monthly donor base is not covering us right now. And we got a lot of funding for our programs. So we're cash rich in our programs, but we're operational budget poor. So I'm trying to figure out how to get us paid to do the work that we have all this money for. So that's COVID. But I do think that it's allowed us to, to get more on point as a leadership team to, to think and to plan. So I think we'll be stronger than ever because of COVID in 2021. Um, and I just want to say uh, Larkin Street Youth Center is a nonprofit based out of San Francisco that helps um, homeless and disadvantaged LGB LGBTQ young people, especially of color, for decades. And so just a very important organization. Mm -hmm. But for me as a researcher, um, it really forced me to rethink the archives and to um, look and reexamine the things that I have. I realized there was value in so many of the, I, I, you know, as a research, we try to go out and find these new things and I, I'm into the white gloves and the, the elevator in this obscure building to go find this thing like an Indiana Jones. But what it forced me to do was to stop, to look at what I have and to reimagine and to rethink. And I realized, wow, you actually have so much more. Actually this collection of photos or this little uh, recording you had from this thing you did, and th this is material. So it's made me see that we can create our own archives. And I encourage everyone listening to document yourself, document your life, document what you're doing, because that has value. And I think uh, many of us as researchers have had to go digital. Um, and that has presented challenges, but it also has created opportunities, right? So um, with a few other graduate students, I started archiving the times because we were worried, well, how are people going to be archiving what's happening now? How are we as history teachers in the future gonna be teaching about 2020? So for me, it's really um, forced me to hunker down, to re-examine what I have and to be creative and to be very imaginative about how I approach things. And I think that the work that I've done is benefiting in that way, right? Um, and I'm very thankful to be supported by Stanford University and for them to invest in studies like this and in work like this, because that's it's afforded the opportunity, unlike so many other African-American people and other people, researchers and professionals out there to actually you know, get paid to do this work. And so um, for me, COVID-19 has created opportunities, but it's also brought us back to our organic selves. Okay, you don't have all this stuff. So that means you just gotta just get organic with it. And I think there's so much possibility and magic within that. So what I saw as a disadvantage before is now to me an advantage. So that's how COVID has impacted me. Thank you both. Um, and next we have a comment, not necessarily a question from Professor Gabrielle Hecht, who says, I just want to say that Aaliyah is a shining star, shining light for the Stanford History Department. Her work is majorly innovative and deeply important, and we are so grateful for the opportunity to work with her. 
And I could not second that anymore. Someone I've known Aaliyah since before Stanford. Um, you are so inspirational. The work you do with your students. If you walk down the street with Aaliyah, you're bound to run into three of her students and they're all ages. It's not just young people. Um, you've had such a terrific just life already. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Um, Thank you. you guys are making me blush. <laughs> Um, Kafri, there's a couple questions for you about how to support hip hop for change. Okay. Um, I'm not necessarily going to read them out, but there's several people asking about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so nonprofits, all they need is awareness and finances. Really, you know, that's this is America. Um, right now, again, like I said, you know, I've got eighty thousand dollars sitting in an account I'm about to put into the studio. That's going to be really amazing, but our monthly donorship went from 27,000 to now 21. And our business costs about 32 a month right now at this limited capacity. So we're really looking for people to be monthly donors. Um, any amount works, it, it helps. But also if you don't have resources, just letting people know about us and about this work that we're doing is really important. Go to our website, uh, uh, please give us your email. We won't spam you, uh, but we'll send you really cool emails telling you when to go to the next show or our what we're doing, who we're working with, or how you can get involved. Um, my biggest thing is that, you know, I go to opera every once in a while, not because I'm Greek, you know, it's because I feel like opera can, you know, a culture me, you know, I can learn something from it. it can, it's an enrichment. I want people to see my culture the same way. So when Hip Hop for Change throws our next environmental equity summit, be an ally, come see what we're talking about. You can't do that if you're not connected to us via the website or our email list or Facebook or LinkedIn. So get with us, give us all your money. We'll use it to teach babies they're beautiful. Uh, and then stick with us because we're trying to build community more than ever, anything. Like when we come together, we can accomplish everything. And I see that if, if in the chat, there's a link to hip, for hiphopforchange.org. And it's also on the, the website for the Center for Global Ethnography. So if you follow up um, and go to the website or you can follow up with the link in the chat, um, there's more information about how you can support hip hop for change there. Uh, and, and also, if you're a person that like listens to hip hop and you're not hip hop cultured, it, it, it is your responsibility to learn about our, the beauty of our culture, not just to be consuming blackness while you're not supporting black people who are dying in this country. So don't just consume us, like be a part of us, you know, and that's. Um, Kafri, another question for you is about, um, you spoke earlier a little bit about capitalism and the impact that it's had on hip hop. I'm curious how, um, like, what is your vision through, you know, making hip hop more accessible, supporting young artists, supporting youth, giving them contracts? What is kind of your bigger vision for um, how you would like to see hip hop culture and how it's consumed in the US, maybe in the world. Generally. Yeah, well, you know, I think I think the problem doesn't lie in consumption. Like people will consume hip hop in any way you throw it out there. People love hip hop, that's everywhere. It's in every country, it's, it's in Antarctica right now, they're rapping somewhere, you know, out there. Um, so I, I think the, the most important thing is it's about who's telling the story, right? Um, and capitalism, you know, I, I don't think corporations, I don't think that, you know, universal is necessarily racist, right? But I do know that, you know, suburban white kids have a lot more money than black kids, right? And I do know that sex, drugs, and violence is the predominant, you know, sellers in all forms of media here, right? And when you intersect sex, drugs, and violence with the black face and then money from white communities, it creates this just evil soup <laughs> that we're dealing with right here. So that's why we have a nonprofit sector because for-profit and government cannot handle the needs of people. That's why the nonprofit sector was invented, right? Uh, so we're building a congruent platform. You know, people say, do you want to take over the industry? Nah, they can keep that. <laughs> I don't want that. Uh, but I do want to make my own platform that's built intentionally in a way that really maximizes the impacts and the positive benefits of hip hop. And if people want to get involved, they can. You know, I want to have a double XL magazine. I want to have a publication, Hip Hop for Change, just like they have. I want to have the same fat hip hop rock the bell style shows, but 
in their case, they got, you know, all these fake gangster rappers. In my case, I'm going to have empowered community cultural activists that are going to be speaking truth to power, connecting people together. I want to be able to do uh, production. I want to produce CDs and make it cheap. Uh, I want to do all this under 501c3. And I think if we can do it like that without profit being the, the driver and making culture and cultural authentic authenticity be the driver, that's what, that's what we had in the 80s with hip hop, right? Before corporations really knew, you know, that they could use it like this and whatnot. They had to come to us and say, yo, who's dope? Who's the, who's the, the, the best lyricist? And then they would invest in that person. And once they figured out that people just want to see black and brown people jumping around and mumble rapping, <laughs> they didn't need to, you know, value our culture or invest in our people. I want to create a platform of hip hop that can only invest in itself, cannot be taken from us. It's going to always remain FUBU. And that's because it's under that 501c3 uh, tent. And yeah, we're always pushing not for profit before a mission. Kafri, I mean, I, Umni, I, I didn't mean to interject, but it, it really made me think about this quote that I was thinking about in, in reference to today um, by James Baldwin, who, who stated this on the Dick Cavett show mm. um, and why organizations like Hip Hop for Change are so important. Um, and I don't have the exact year, but I know for sure this was in the late 60s, maybe 67, mm -hmm. but don't quote me on that. <laughs> but he said, oh, excuse me, I do have the date. Hello, 1969. <laughs> Um, James Baldwin on the Dick Cavett show says, what the American public has always tried to do is accommodate me into a system which has always meant my death to become an accomplice to my own murder. And mm -hmm. I think that by you creating this platform outside of this very toxic structure, right, you are not adding to that toxic culture that, you know, there's so much death is attached to. So for me, I think as Coffrey said before, what you're doing, what we're all doing is what black people have been doing. I don't think we need to search forward for answers. We just need to look back. Yeah, you know? word. And, 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 and also it's, it's really important. I mean, I, I try to frame this for people, right? Uh, and this is something I used to say to, to people in the streets, like 40% of the human trafficking in California happens in the Bay, right? These are 12 to 14 year old girls on average, right? I think it's like 44% African-American, like 25.6% Latina, uh, something like that. So these young girls are dealing with just everything, right? How do they get out of that? Uh, hypothetically, where do they get the information on their own efficacy, their own abilities? Though they're probably not going to read three page emails from Girls Inc., are they? You know what I'm saying? With hyperlinks and like, they're probably not going to be doing that, but they are going to be listening to hip hop. Right now, you know, they might only have access to a song like WAP or whatever. I don't know. But if I can connect these young girls to more than just songs centered around sexuality, if I can connect them to the entirety of their potential experiences through artists like Coco Pela, artists like Ryan Nicole, like Kayla Love, like Aaliyah Sharif, like these badass women in Oakland. Melina Jones. Melina Jones! Ah! Sorry, my bad, Melina, if you see this. Uh, but yeah, but these women hold the ideas of worth, hold the ideas of strength and, and ability. And whoever controls the narratives these young girls have access to is the person controlling those young women, right? And it should not be some dude. It should not be corporations. It should not be corporations that are beholden to suburban kids' desires and needs, right? It should be people from our community that can show them what they are going to go through, right? It should be Melina Jones who says, hey, this is how you become an empowered woman in this space in the Bay Area. Because these young girls out here, they need help now. And they, you know, I mean, Girls Inc. is one of the dopest organizations the Bay Area has, but these 12 to 14 year old girls are not getting emails with hyperlinks about how to get free. They're getting hip hop and they want hip hop and they're primed for it. So we should give it to them in a way that's gonna you know, uplift them. And that's just one way to frame it so you can see how important hip hop is to us as people. Um, I'm gonna selfishly interject another question and I'll go back to the audience questions. Um... You know, both of you come out of this like community that has done so much resistance and political work. And we're right now living in a moment where anti-Black violence is especially visible, where killings are happening almost on the daily. Um, I'm curious how your activism 
your artwork, your scholarly work helps you navigate or so like, yeah, helps you navigate um, this like really terrible moment that we're in? I would, you know, mental health is so important. One of the things that I've really struggled with is the proliferation of the, you know, what many people refer to as racial pornography. I am not going to spend my afternoon watching video after video after video after video. I want us to think about, let's go back a century. What if people were able to videotape lynchings and watch that over and over and over again and what that does to your mind? as just your psyche. It took me days, weeks to recover, and I'm still processing. So for me to speak to your question, what art does is allow me to heal. It allows me to process. It allows me to get that trauma out of my body. You know, Coffrey spoke earlier about um, sort of the cathartic nature of dance and music, but whatever form you're expressing yourself in, we have so few avenues. It's important for us all, whether we be African-American or not, how directly affected by this or, or not to express ourselves, whether that be through research, whether it be through dance, whether it be through writing, whether it be through planting your garden. Without self-expression, that toxicity stays inside your body. It stays inside everything. And eventually it will kill you. So for me, the arts is um, a vehicle for transcendence. It's how we heal, but it's also how we, but see, the, the thing about art is not, it's not about running away from the pain. Art is not running away from the trauma. It's about confronting it. So I feel like as artists, as scholars, as people in this world, when you engage through creative expression, it forces you to confront it head on and move through it, move within it, and you come out on the other side. You know, you're not going to be healed automatically you know, but you gain perspective, you become stronger and you realize that it is, this is maybe a part of who I am, but it's not of me. It's not who I am and you can move through it. So for me, I feel like that's really key that we continue to engage in art and artistic practices to even turn off the screen, for goodness sakes, turn off the screen and go dance outside in the grass as Colette, right, El Wa. Um, and Joanna Highgood told us to um, write a poem, sing out loud in your apartment, do whatever you've got to do, because that's the only way we're going to get through this is by going back to the root, going back to the source, expressing ourselves. If I hadn't expressed myself, you know, through dance, through the performing arts, through poetry, I don't know where I'd be right now, you know? Um, yeah, I mean... As somebody who was beaten at gunpoint twice by the SFPD, um, who currently has PTSD uh, and goes breaks into cold sweats when a cop gets behind me, and I don't do anything, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, you know, uh, uh, we've never really needed to turn on Facebook to see people lynched. Uh, you know, people get lynched all the time in my neighborhood, including my, you know, I almost got lynched myself. Cashing my first paycheck as a 15 year old with three friends coming from the SF League or Urban Gardens and felt the full brunt of the SFPD thinking four 15 year olds were robbing a bank. Um, but yeah, how do you deal with that? I remember when uh, Tamir Rice was murdered. I was, I, I almost couldn't function. I, you know, it's like the air was jello to walk through. It was like viscous. And I was just trying to get to my radio show and I could barely get to my radio show. Um, and I got on the air and I was just like, people, I'm just going to go ahead and speak to y'all. Um, and by the end of that show, I really put all of my feelings that were amorphous and intangible into real solid constructs of how I felt about things. And I, I spoke truth to power through the radio show. And I walked out of that show feeling so good, so good. I had people call me and say, yo, I needed to hear that too. Um, and, you know, not even in terms of rapping or dancing or even art, but just being able to take these feelings that are just hard to digest and put them into small bite-sized nuggets that we get and we can understand and really overstand, right? Really, un like, get it. I think that's the, the thing that 
that is necessary, whether you're an artist or not, but it's also the thing that art is really good for. You know, when I write bars and I write raps, like the rap that I even performed for this, it's like, what is black arts? What is resistance? And by the time I finish writing my, my rap, I'm like, oh, no, this is dope. Can I tell you? Can I show you? You know, it it, it 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 makes it so these things are easier to work with instead of feeling like we're just victims and feeling like we have no efficacy to do anything. I think that's all we need is to, to know that we can do something, whether it's just understanding it so we can have a conversation with our partner or our sons or our family com community members or whether we can take that understanding and weaponize it and, and, and attack white supremacy with it, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the most important thing is the search for understanding. Uh, and then, you know, I, I don't think anybody's ever solved white supremacy. I don't think we're going to solve it in my lifetime, you know? Um, and I don't think we need to solve it in my lifetime for me to be okay emotionally. But I do need to feel like I have some efficacy in the world to make an impact so my daughter has an easier time. So. Mm. You know, Coffrey, I was going to say that the what you're, these little nuggets you were talking about are not digestible. This is not digestible. It's toxic. And it's so toxic. I think that part of it is that when you when you eat something toxic or when something toxic goes into your body, you know, um, you have to get it out. And so for me, I think that we these forces that we're dealing with, it's not in, it's not digestible. It's not something that's going to pass. It, they're they're highly dangerous, and and that's how we need to start looking at it. Like yeah. this is nine one one. You know, yeah. this is not a passing moment. This is not just support hip hop for change or read a book. This is all our lives are at stake right now. All of our lives, and um, and so much has been given. You know, I stand on the shoulders of many ancestors for us to be here. So we honor them through the work that we do and through our art. But this is not normal, it's not okay, it's not digestible. And we all need to be enraged, not just black Americans. This should yeah. enrage us all, <laughs> you know? And, and especially in a place like San Francisco where you see such a, you know affluent progressive people living down the block from people who are in abject poverty. You know what I'm saying? Like how can you walk past us every day and be okay, how? You know, there's that one, I think Jane Elliott said it. It's like, hey, white people in the audience, stand up if you want to be treated like black people, right? And she waited a second and she's like, oh, oh, none of you stood up. Oh, no, nobody stood up. She's like, so that means you know how black people are getting treated and you know you don't want to be treated like that for yourselves. So why are you so willing to stand back and let it happen to them, right? And I was like, oh, Jane, I love you, sister. I love you. Thank you for calling them out like that because I think that, that little microcosm is a perfect representation of what we have in, in San Francisco. We have these people who- and Go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, you know, there are a lot of people probably listening who want to know about, well, how can I be an ally, right? Well, what can I do with that? Um, and I think, you know, your example made me think about something as small as saying hello, right? Um, <laughs> crossing that uncomfortable barrier and 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 inviting those you know people over to your home or to the you know um, supporting your local community. So 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 Kafri, I think that um, it's really important that we think about the simple dailiness of the oppression that we experience can also be undone by the simple daily interactions that that we can engage in. So there's no mystery to it. It's about saying hello. And really, it's just about connecting with people on a human level that don't look like you. And that goes for Black people too, right? We've got to start telling each other our stories. We've got to start connecting. And and the change that I've been doing, uh, you know, Coffrey J, Aaliyah, these leaders, activists, really, those are all titles. I just started helping people in my community. I literally just started making sandwiches for my students. I literally just started working at my school. It really starts small. Change does not have to be big. And more often than not, the change that changes the world mm -hmm. is the, it are those is that change that starts with a conversation with a few people and a few intentional actions. And if we all do a little bit of that in these really troubling times, that energy gets pressed into the land, into our environment, and it reverberates back a thousand times. So if you want to find out a way to help, you know, look to your own community, look outside your door, say hello. Please and it's say hello. quite simple. Please say hello when you're passing me on the street. I do not bite. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's not, like you said, Aaliyah, that's not just to white folks, it's to everybody. You know what I'm saying? I think it's right now time for us to start throwing love into the space. Uh, and, you know, that's the one beautiful thing about hip hop. It's rooted in the tenets of peace, love, unity, and having fun. So if we can just rock with the principle of hip hop, I think we'll be all right. Uh, say hello to people walking down the street that don't look like you. Go eat some food that doesn't come from your people. Go learn about, you know, I usually tell when I do my lectures and I want people to understand why culture and blackness is so important to me. I say, go learn a song in your ancestors' native language. Like, understand how cool that is. And let that, 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 those, those, those roots resonate through you. You can understand my experience walking as a black man in San Francisco, maybe. That's beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions that I'm going to combine. Um, what can grant makers in the arts do to thoughtfully support Black creatives and organizations? And uh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, we talk about this so often uh, with Hema Cantu, our development director. Um, number one, for every $100,000 of grants that are given to arts programs, usually we're creating $10,000 of deficit in those programs because real costs are not being included into those grants, right? So we have all the money to teach the babies and maybe even pay me, but I'm not paying for the gas. I'm not paying for the planning meeting and stuff like that. So when you look into the industry, for every $100,000 of grants given out to arts organizations, we're creating around $10,000 of deficit. A lot of these work that we do, uh, we're having... Like look who's look who's deciding who gets the grants. They usually don't look like the people on this this call, right? So there's a problem there. But I also think the way that grants are given, only, only oh man, excuse me, only about five percent of grants are even there for operational budgets. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these grants, they these foundations, they figured out the way they think helping works. Right. And a lot of times, you know, if they're trying to help the black community, they say, OK, this is what black people need. I think we got to flip that around because I'm struggling right now as an organization to pay my overhead, not my programmatic stuff. And so when we go look for that and look for those spaces, I just got to give props to the Zellerbach Family Foundation for giving us one of the first unrestricted grants we've gotten in years um, where we were able to do what we actually needed to do. So to foundations supporting arts out there. You know, I think that we need to stop, you know, having these ideas of what needs to be funded and these, you need to start speaking to these organizations on the bottom. You'll find out that they really just need to have respect and trust given to them and let them know they can get some money, you know, and, and trust yeah, that you know what's best. That's exactly really what I was going to say, because so much of being a dancer and a performer and having been had the pleasure of dancing with many dance companies or not many <laughs> the dance companies I've been able to dance with, a lot of their artistic vision was stifled by the confines of the grant. So maybe we want to do this, but ooh, this is our audience. And if you could just make that a little bit more ethnic, right? It's a, too contemporary. And the, the, the audience really just wants to see that traditional. So I think that um, these kinds of foundations have to be able to take risk on artist vision and trust. And instead of giving the audience what they want, give them actually what they need. Because the most innovative art is art that shocks and surprises and sometimes makes you uncomfortable. But if you allow the artists to do what they're supposed to do, the audiences will come. But if we keep catering to these same tropes because we have money and this is what they want, then the artists are gonna perpetually be compromising their vision and then we perpetuate this cycle. So it's really artistic freedom, I would say, which is what Coffrey um, was expressing. Thank you both so much for everything that you shared with us. We're at time and I just wanna keep going and keep asking you questions. Um, yeah, this was very moving, especially right now. Um, I'm in Philadelphia where Wallace, um, Walter Wallace was just murdered and it's just, it's amazing to hear you all talk about, um, you know, going out and talking to people when your people are being killed. Um, yeah, thank you for the work that you do. And thank you for being yeah, here. And I'll say before we part on that note, you know, lastly, there are people dying. And the fact that, and what African-American people have always been able to do is in times even like this, when our own people are even being killed, 
is to still dedicate ourselves to this work because that's how we have survived. So if we as Black Americans can be taking our morning and doing this and speaking to you and doing this work, I think that, you know, if you have the pri privilege, then get out there and do something. And, it, and now is the time. So I just want to thank you, Stanford. Thank you for the Center for Global Ethnography. Thank you, Nia. And thank you, Coffrey. And thank you all for being here with us. And I just, let me just say here now, that's all the time we have, but I want to thank Aliyah, Umnia, Kafre, and David and Claudia on behalf of Sylvia, Yanagisako and myself. I am just so grateful for all the time, the passion, the energy of this conversation. It just meant so, so very much, as you say, at this moment. Um, I'd also like to thank again our event co-sponsors, African, Amer African and African American Studies and History. This is our final event in the Methods of Protest series. And just to remind you all for more information about this event and to watch recordings of other events in the Methods of Protest series, please visit irissstanfordedu forward slash ethnography. And there you'll find movements of change, dance, liberation, and the power of aesthetics, a conversation also with Aliyah Dan Salahuddin and the Bay Area choreographers, dancers, and activists, Joanna Haygood and Colette Elwa under the programs tab. We've been dropping all kinds of websites throughout the q and I hope that you got a chance to copy them down before they ended. I also just want to maybe end with the words of the late but immortal Toni Morrison, I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. And on behalf of all of us, thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>